but I thought the simplicity with which you laid this out was, was really kind of brilliant. Because basically, as I said at the top, you're giving people 12 sort of ways to stop being pathetic. I mean, that's what it really struck me as. So I just want to, we can hit yes, each one. Yes, written from the point of someone who tried to stop being pathetic. Because I'm not saying, look, you're pathetic and I got the answers. It's like, no, no, no. It's like, I got plenty of work to do on myself, you know, so. Yeah, that, so. that's a key piece of this though, right? For you personally, that you're not walking around going, I've got, I, I'm perfect. And, you know, we, no, no, just two weeks ago, we spent a couple hours and we were talking about our own shortcomings and what we're struggling with and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that, yeah. that's, an, but you're open about it. So few people are open about it. Yeah, well, I'm like, I'm, I live in some terror of making a mistake, knowing full well that I'm perfectly capable of making that sort of mistake, you know, and so, and I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying or trying to act out the idea that I've got, what would you say, that I'm without error. I, that's just, <laughs> no, we just won't go there. That's we won't for go there. sure. Fair enough. So this first one, and again, okay. there was a simplicity to this that I loved. So the first one, rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. I love that one as the first one because when I first started doing stand up, I used to see a lot of guys hunched over the mic. Yeah. Really bad posture, well known comics. And I always remember thinking, you got to stand up straight. Yeah, well, you've got good posture. Just now. I guess so, I, yeah, I guess you something do. happened. Yeah. yeah, 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 you do. So, so you know, my, and my wife is a massage therapist and she's very physiologically aware. And so, she's also helped me with this sort of thing but we watch people on the streets all the time and people in general now have very poor posture yeah. it's very bad for them well, I mean, that's, that's got to be phone related too right we're all well yeah I think that's part of it but I also think it's something our culture doesn't attend to like you kind of have to remind your kids to stand up you know it takes a certain amount of conscious effort but yeah in that chapter I talk a lot about lobsters which I'm, I'm kind of I kind of have an affinity for lobsters and because they well the the short story is that when a lobster loses a fight, because they're fighting all the time for dominance, let's say, in their hierarchies, he kind of crunches down, so he looks smaller. When he wins a fight, he stretches out, looks bigger. And so he's signaling to other lobsters the tally of his victories, mm -hmm. let's say. So if a lobster has won a fight, he's more likely to win the next fight than you would calculate from having a tally of all his previous defeats and victories. And if he loses a fight, then he's more likely to lose the next fight. So that's that, that Matthew principle at work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think, well, so what? So what does that have to do with anything? It's like, okay, here, part of the kicker is, well, the lobster runs on serotonin, neurochemical. And if the lobster loses, the serotonin levels go down. And if he wins, the serotonin levels go up. And when the serotonin levels go up, he stretches out and he's a confident lobster. And one of the consequences of that is if a lobster loses a battle and you give him the equivalent of antidepressants then he stretches out and he'll go fight again so antidepressants work on lobsters huh. right and you think well who cares it's like no 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 you don't get it we diverged from lobsters from an evolutionary perspective 350 million years ago and it's the same circuit it's absolutely unbelievable and that shows you how deep inside you how basic how primordial that circuit is in you that's sizing other people up and looking at where they fit in the hierarchy well, with human society it's more like hierarchies of competence mm -hmm. than dominance per se but and like if your serotonin levels fall you get depressed, you crunch forward, and, and the whole, everything around you turns cloudy and black, and, and then you're inviting more oppression, right? And so you get into this bad loop, you know, and so it's really important to, if you're trying to get your act together, it's really important to stretch yourself out and, and sit up properly, because it's, it's part of the psychophysiological loop that can start you on the upward curve. And so it's a really important thing to take note of. And like if you've been bullied, say when you were a kid, maybe you've moved and so it's sort of irrelevant, you're still carrying that with you in the, in the sh hunched shoulders and then you can't breathe properly mm -hmm. and your voice isn't right. And, and you invite more bullying because the predator types are always looking for people who, who look like they can be intimidated and who mm -hmm. will make a nice fuss if they are, you know, like a nice gratifying They'll make nice gratifying sounds of suffering if you torment them, right? Because <laughs> right. that's what a bully really wants. And so that's what the first chapter is about. It's like, it's about hierarchy, about, and it's a critique in some sense also of the idea of the patriarchy. I know, because the patriarchy is this dominant, oppressive hierarchy that everyone's embedded in. And, you know, the social constructionist, social justice warrior, postmodernist types think about that as a social construction. It's like, how about no? That's just wrong. Lobsters have hierarchies. That's a third of a billion years ago, okay? That's not a social construction. 
It's part of being itself. And if you only see a hierarchy as power and, and tyranny, then you're looking at the world wrong. Like, it's true that hierarchies can be tyrannical and dominant. Mm -hmm. and, and a degenerated hierarchy is nothing but tyranny. But in a functional society, the, the hierarchy is actually the structure of the society. And you're actually protected within it. Well, then how you relate to that hierarchy is very important. But that's part of personal development. That's part of standing upright. You know, and then people in the hierarchy think, oh, well, you're someone who could do good things for the hierarchy. Let's promote you. Yeah. You know, like, men don't struggle for power. That isn't what men do. Not if they're civilized. They size each other up and elect the competent to lead them. And they do that at every level of society. Like, I tell a story in there about, it might be later in, in another chapter, it doesn't matter. I worked in a rail crew in, in, in southern Saskatchewan. They're rough guys, like a lot of them had been in prison, you know. And when you first came onto the rail crew, you got a stupid nickname and people teased you. And I remember this one kid called Lunch Bucket. That was his nickname because he came to the rail crew with a lunch bucket that looked like his mom had packed it. That was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. You bring your damn lunch in kind of a you know, ratty paper bag. Right. And you don't make too big a thing out of and it. And it's you know? dirty and smelly. Yeah, that's exactly and, yeah. right. It's like you're not pronouncing your status with yeah. your lunch bucket. You don't bucket. have a Barbie lunch bucket. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So they named him Lunch Bucket, which he wasn't very happy about. Yeah. Well, that was a mistake. He should have taken it with a smile. And then he was always peevish and irritable. And if you asked him to do something, he'd whine. And so, like, hmm. this was soon after I joined the Royal, Royal Rail Crew. Well, soon, there was about 60 men on this crew. It stretched out about a quarter of a mile down the tracks. Soon, anonymous harassers were throwing pebbles at him during work. We had hard hats on, so the game was, let's see if we can hit a lunch bucket in the, in the hard hat with a pebble. Anonymous, it makes a nice, anonymous. Uh, yeah, well, because you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. And, and that was purposeful, because he didn't, couldn't take a joke. It's like, well, let's see if he can take this joke. Clunk, and everybody go, ha, ha, you know. And then he just got more and more peevish, and the pebbles got bigger and bigger, and, you know, a week later, lunch bucket was gone having not learned anything from the experience. But, you know, the men were testing him out. It's like, can you take a joke? Can you, can you, can you be useful? Can you at least be amusing? Like, mm -hmm. can, is there something worthwhile about you? It's like, no. It's like, okay, well, then you're out of here because you never know when we actually might need to depend on you. It's so interesting to me because it, it fits fully within what you were saying about why it's important to, for a father to play with a kid or, or why sibling. My brother and I used to beat the living crap out of each other. He'd win sometimes, I'd win sometimes, yep. but we learned something there. And that's what I, you, I think you said, it's like learning how to dance. And yeah, it, it, all it kind is. Of makes sense. It but is. I like that you started this with something physical because yep. all of us can do this. Everyone watching this today that's struggling with whatever they're struggling can just work on that. Yeah. Even, even whoever's watching this that has God's best given posture ever can still work on that. Yeah, so I well, it was, if you happen to be hunched forward, you know weightlifting is really good for that because you strengthen out your back muscles and it'll pull your shoulders back. And you want that. And it's really important as you get older, because you look at old people, you know, and, and if they're stooped, they start to yeah. calcify that way. And then they start to bend down. Yeah. And like, you know, you don't want to be in that situation when you're 40. Yeah. You know, maybe you want to be in that. You don't ever. You don't, you don't ever. But, but yeah. maybe 90, you know, but not 40 and certainly not 20. And no. so, you know, you need to do a postural analysis and, or have someone take a look at you and say, well, you know, yeah, you're kind of hunched forward and you've got to be conscious mm -hmm. about it. You've got to pull back a lot and open up. No. It's also kind of a, I think part of the reason it signifies dominance is because like this is a protective crouch, right? And it's to stop animals that jump on your back from getting at your soft part. So it's, it's, it's instinctual. It's protective, right? So this basically says, I'm open to the world, right? But what it also says is I can handle being open to the world. So it signifies competence and confidence. Yeah, it's interesting because it's also a sort of vulnerable position. Yeah, and, definitely. And in, and in, you know, yoga or certain other stretching things, Feldenkrais yeah. and things like that, you would work on this. Yeah. You would also, with the mansplaining people will not be happy when they... No, no, they're not. They're, they're going to see us doing this. They're not going to be happy about yeah, that. Yeah, well, the thing about competence is acceptance of vulnerability. Right. That's, that's what competence is. It's, that's a deep idea. Yeah. I mean, the deepest Christian idea, for example, is that you should accept the vulnerability of being. That's the acceptance of the crucifixion, essentially. It's like, you know, you're at the X where all the suffering takes place. You're going to whine about that, you know, and get resentful and bitter about it? Because there's reason to. Like, let's make no mistake about it. Or you're going to say, bring it on. Mm -hmm. I can handle it, no matter what it is. Well, maybe... Maybe you can't do that, but that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming, you're aiming at being able to handle it, no matter what it is, and to do that voluntarily. And the idea is that if you can do that, you will transcend the tragedy. 
And it's like, well, could that be true? Well, most people admire tough, competent people. So you know it's at least a little bit true. Mm -hmm. You know, you admire the courageous. So, well, how courageous can you get? That's the question. How courageous can you get? Well, you practice and see. And it makes you want to be better. I'll tell you, I didn't tell you this two weeks ago, but when we did that event, which was spectacular, at the end, when all the kids were coming up to say hi to us, there's a line for the two of us. Your line did have more people. There were plenty on mine too, but I actually felt after, truly, I was like, I have to be better now. This means I have to be better. And I thought, I felt great about it. Like I actually didn't feel jealous of you or whatever. I was like, oh, he brought it. And it's like, I should bring it too. So that well, that competition a, is a, is a wonderful thing. It is. It is. Well, the thing is, is that, and that's the opposite of, of well, in the story of Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel because he can't stand the fact that he's better than him. That's really it. It's he knows he's better than him. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. And and so Abel is actually his ideal because that's what it means to see someone who's better than you. If you get jealous of that, you're getting jealous of your own ideal. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very bad idea. It's like what you should do is you should watch and you should think well. There's something going on there that I haven't quite got. And maybe if I watch, I could figure it out. It's like it's an opportunity, right. you know? It doesn't mean so, you gotta take that guy down and in this case, kill him. It means right. you gotta work on your stuff. It's, well, it's, that's, yeah, well, it's an opportunity even to do that, you know? Yeah. And you also have to remember, too, that people have their times and, you know, things oscillate. And sometimes you meet someone who's kind of at a pinnacle in their life in some sense, and you're not. That doesn't mean it's always gonna stay that way. That's the other thing is like, even very successful people have their, well, they get sick and die, you know, it's yeah. like, you gotta remember yeah. that. We're, we've got this fundamental limitation that equalizes us in some sense, and that's also very much worth, worth knowing. You know, it's like, you don't know, when you see someone successful, you don't know the full tragedy of their yeah. being, and so uh, there's another chapter in there that I, it's yeah. called, compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. One is the loneliest number that you left. Since the number one uh -huh.